Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. You'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we all start today's bonus episode where I am super excited to welcome back to the ATA podcast show the awesome Mary Hunter. Mary earned her undergraduate degree in biology from the University of Chicago and a master's degree in behavior analysis from the University of North Texas. She consults with people and their pets working mainly with dogs and horses. In addition, Mary teaches online courses for professional animal trainers and others interested in the science of behavior through her company, Behavior Explorer. Mary has taught classes at the University of North Texas as an adjunct instructor. Her interest in instructional design led her to convert an upper-level undergraduate class into a self-paced mastery-based course using Dr. Fred Keller's personalized system of instruction. In 2019, Mary and Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz published their first book, Portal, the Portable Operant Research and Teaching Lab. Mary's primary research interests include studying the process of shaping and developing better methods for teaching both people and animals. She is a full member of the Association for Behaviour Analysis International and has presented her research at the organisation's annual conference. Mary also likes to share stories of her animal training adventures on her personal blog, StaleCherios.com. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Mary Hunter back to the show today. Mary, thank you so much for taking the time to come and hang out with us again on the Animal Training Academy podcast show. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Uh, It's an absolute joy and I I had a big smile on my face as I read the name of your blog, Stale Cheerios. I think it's one of my favorite named blogs. Aptly named, am I wrong? Because you had some stale Cheerios to reinforce was it was it a, a guinea pig or a hamster you were training? It was a it was a dog. Um, it was a dog. But, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, people ask me about that all the time. They're like, "Why is your blog called Stale Cheerios?" And um, it's just a silly, funny name. But um, I've actually I've had the blog for over a decade now. But when um, when I was first getting started um, shifting into um, positive reinforcement training and clicker training. Um, I was doing some training with my parents' dog at the time, Ginger, and um, I was trying to figure out like what would be a good reinforcer for her. And I was experimenting with different things. And, um, you know, of course, I wanted something small that would be easy to deliver. And my parents had a box of stale Cheerios in the cupboard that nobody was eating. And so I started using those one day with the dog. And the dog loved them. So, um, so, so it was, you know, I, I, why I like that story is because I think sometimes we think in training that we have to have like the best reinforcer or like the biggest reinforcer or the most valuable reinforcer. And, and, you know, I think sometimes actually we get in trouble when we have really high value reinforcers because they're just it's too much. Um, so, you know, the, the idea there is we just have to have something that will be a reinforcer and something that will um, work effectively for our animal. And and for ginger, stale Cheerios were a really good reinforcer, um, and and I like that I like that story too because I think um, it, it reminds me that reinforcers are always individual to our individual learners. So something that's a reinforcer for one individual um, 
is not necessarily going to be a good reinforcer for another individual. So that's something we need to we need to ask our learners and we need to do a little bit of testing and experimenting to figure out like what's going to be the best reinforcer for them. Never throw away your stale Cheerios because you never know when they might reinforce a life. <laughs> I <laughs> Right, right. And I'm reminded of you, it sounds weird, and I'm reminded of your blog every time I'm in the breakfast aisle at the supermarket. <laughs> I see Cheerios <laughs> and I'm like, Mary Hunter. Um, let's move on. Today I'm thrilled to share a number of things with our audience, uh, but one of the things is about a new project you're working on with your partner, Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz, and also Crystal Fernandez, and this is the 2023 Behavior Explorer Summit, Building Reinforcement Systems for Accelerated Learning. I'm excited later to discuss reinforcement systems with you and share some common misconceptions about reinforcement. But before we do that, can you quickly share with the audience about the summit? What is it and where can they go to learn more? Yeah, sure. Thank you, um, Ryan. So in March and April, um, Dr. Jesus Rosales Rees, Crystal Fernandez, and I will be doing a summit, which will be a series of um, four virtual um, meetings. Um, and and what we're going to be discussing and talking about is actually it's funny that we were just talking about the stale Cheerios. You know, I think oftentimes we know we have a really valuable reinforcer that our animal likes and that our animal is willing to work for, but we still are having slow rates of progress, low levels of engagement, unwanted behaviors, and that can be really frustrating for us. So what we're going to be looking at in the summit is how do we analyze our reinforcement systems and our reinforcement delivery and how do we use reinforcement even more effectively um, to accelerate the progress of our training and to increase um, learner engagement? So, so it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be exploring some of the things that we've been researching and looking at over the past couple of years. And um, I think it's going to lead some, to some really interesting discussions. So if people want more information, um, there's lots more on the behaviorexplorer.com website. Well, that sounds very exciting, and we're going to link to all of that in the show notes as well and give you guys listening a teaser as to some of the things that you might learn about in this summit. But for now, I'm, I'm looking forward to discussing reinforcement systems and some common misconceptions about reinforcement for the listeners of this show. Reinforcement systems are something that we inside the Animal Training Academy membership were super fortunate to learn more about from you, Mary, in November last year as part of our new ATA yearly curriculum, which is available to all of our ATA paying members. And it was so eye-opening for me to put the microscope on this area of our training, which honestly, I thought I had covered. But to unpack it the way you teach it and dissect it into so many easily understandable and helpful parts it's pretty much it's changed the way I, I look at training, and I don't I don't say that lightly. I feel like I'm underestimating how much of an impact it's had on my training. Um, so much so that I now spend entire days with teams I work with just focusing on our reinforcement systems. So to get started, Mary, I thought maybe for everyone listening, we could define what we mean when we say reinforcement systems. What what do we mean? Can you please define this for us? Yeah, that's a. I think that's a great place to get started, Ryan. And I'll mention as well. I had a I had a great time at the end of last year, um, hanging out with everybody in ATA and and looking more closely at at reinforcement systems and how we can use reinforcers um, more effectively. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but so when we say reinforcement system, um, what we're talking about there is the the back and forth sequence of interactions between the teacher and between the learner um, while we're delivering the reinforcer and while our learner is consuming the reinforcer. And I think this is really interesting and really important because I think it's something we often neglect or we often overlook when we're training. Like we think about, oh, we need a reinforcer and we think a little bit about how we're going to deliver it, but we maybe we don't think about this um, in in the level of detail that we need to be. Um, and actually I'm gonna back up just a second because I think that may that may help give the a better picture here of what I'm talking about. So 
often when we're talking about our training sessions and our interactions with our animals, um, we often describe this in terms of the ABCs. And um, I know many of your listeners are probably already familiar with that idea, but I'll, I'll summarize it briefly if there's people who haven't heard this idea of the ABCs. So when we're talking about the ABCs, we have the what behavior analysts call the antecedents. That's like the jargony scientific word. And those are like your cues or your signals that are, are um, using to um, tell your animal what behavior to do. And then the B in the middle there is the desired behavior that your animal engages in. And you follow that by the C, the consequence. And here, consequences is not something bad. That's the, that's the reinforcer. That's the reward that you're using um, to strengthen and to maintain your animal's behavior. So we think of training in terms of cue, behavior, reward. And we think of it in terms of the animal doing the behavior and then the trainer giving the reward. Um, however, if we, if, we, if we think about it and if we look closely, while we're delivering a reinforcer to our animal, there are a lot of behaviors that we're doing, but there's also a lot of behaviors that our animal is doing as well. So even with a fairly simple way of delivering reinforcers, you know, so say I have a dog in front of me and the dog sits and that's the behavior I want to reinforce. I might click the clicker, which is a behavior on my part. My dog's ears might perk up when he hears the clicker. That's a behavior on his part. Then I might start reaching into my treat pouch to get a treat. And as I do that, the dog's eyes will probably follow my hand. He may even make a little head turn um, as he watches my hand movement. Um, and then as I get the treat and I lean down towards the dog, um, depending on where the dog is in relation to me, he may take a step forward towards my hand. And then I may present my hand, my flat hand a little bit below his chin. His chin may go down towards my hand. That's that's another behavior on his part. Um, my hand opens up, his mouth opens. That's another behavior on his part. And then he takes the treat from my hand, um, chews the treat, swallows the treat. And then as I stand back up, um, his head may come back up to look back at me again. So um, all of that happens in the course of just a few seconds. Um, but but I, we, I think we sometimes forget, you know, we think of just the behavior as the desired behavior we're wanting the animal to do. And we forget about all of these behaviors that are happening um, during reinforcement delivery. And so that's really, when I say the term reinforcement system, that's really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this um, back and forth chain of interactions. And um, I also can refer to it as an interlocking chain of interactions um, um, that happens during 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 the reinforcement delivery process. And why I think it's important for us to think about this is because the interactions that take place during reinforcement delivery can make it um, easier for us to teach our animals whatever behaviors we're working on. And then if, if those interactions are not arranged right, or if we have unwanted behaviors creeping in there, um, then, then that can really um, slow down our training. And that also can, sometimes we have what should be a really good reinforcer, but because these interactions are not working in the right way, um, we, we get disengagement from our animal or we get an animal who doesn't want to participate um, because, because these interactions are not set up right or there's unwanted behaviors or our animal is just confused or frustrated or doesn't understand um, what to do. You, you really got me talking there, Ryan. Um, <laughs> Um, I, well, it's it's so it's so valuable. I think it, it it sounds like such a simple part of our training, but it, it is so powerful. When when I'm going to say you, we get so we talked about ABCs, right? We talked about the the ABC of you cue animal does behavior, you provide a reinforcer, and it reminded me of a conversation I had with Dr. Susan Friedman on, I think it was episode 100 of this podcast show, where funnily enough, we were talking about Mary Hunter and Mary Hunter's process or Mary Hunter's um, offering that she gave to our community using portal of teaching duration within the chain. Uh, and we're talking about Susan's dog barking at the back door to be let out. 
and we started talking about ABCs and we started to break it down into ABCs and Susan, I, I offered a lot of ABCs and Susan's like, I don't think we need that many ABCs. I th- my memory might be wrong here, but it went something like this. I don't think we need that many ABCs. And she said, how granular you want to get with your ABCs it depends on how valuable that is for you. So here, the suggestion really is to get more granular with our ABCs and, and, and not just look at it as a simple cue behavior reinforcement, um, but that behavior reinforcement and then how that reinforcement becoming an antecedent for the next ABC. So getting getting really granular um, without yeah, contingencies you know, I, during the process. I, I love I love that you brought up um brought up what Susan said because um it's a really really nice way to think about it. And one way I like to think about it too sometimes it's al- it's almost kind of like if you think back to like high school biology, it's like we have a microscope and it's like we can adjust the zoom level on the microscope. Um so you know sometimes I think, you know, and if things are going pretty well, we can just think of things as in terms of a b c um and 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 our training's going smooth and everything's all right. But I think um, when we're building something new, you know, perhaps it's a new way of delivering reinforcers that you haven't worked with before, or perhaps you have a, a brand new learner who's new to learning, um, um, you know, in those types of situations where there's a new element, um, I think it can be helpful to kind of dial in and zoom zoom in a little bit with the microscope and to look um, within the sea at at all of the back and forth interactions happening. Um, and or and, and then of course as well, if you're having um, problem behaviors or unwanted behaviors creep into your training or creep into your um, reinforcement delivery, then then it can be really valuable to to zoom in and to look at the back and forth interaction. Yeah, I think this is a great great. Example of um, when I talk about or when someone talks about granularity of ABCs and when it's when and when it's not valuable is, is the example you just gave then. Um, and, then, and then when you were talking, it reminded me of, I used to take videos of people's reinforcement systems, although I didn't have words to label it back then. Um, and then <laughs> using iMovie, I would get the segment of the video where the click happened and slow it down. And the video of the segment where the click happens, so click, click, push down on the click, lift your thumb back off the clicker and get the second click. I I found that it was roughly about 0.6 seconds long when when an average person did a quick click. And when you slow it down and you watch, you watch. (laughs) I'm impressed that you timed it. That's super cool. Oh man, I've got these, I've got these really old videos stored with an ATA somewhere and when you then slow it down, so you've got 0.6 seconds. Obviously, if you push play on that, like it's, you, if you blink, you're going to miss it. Right. But if you can slow it down by 200, 400%, so then it actually becomes like a four or five second clip video. And you watch that and you watch how far a hand can move. If someone's, if someone's moving their hand at the wrong time, this is why we used to do it, to kind of highlight that. Um, then the hand can move quite far in 0.6 seconds. That's one thing. But if you look at the animal, the learner, the amount of behavior that a learner can do in 0.6 seconds is mind-blowing. Yeah, yeah. And so that ties into all, all, all the things you're saying about what's the animal doing when you're eating, what's the animal doing when these tiny little nuances of what we do happen. Yeah, and, you know, it's, that's interesting because I think – um, I think when you see that on the video and when you watch it in slow motion and you see how many tiny behaviors your animal's doing, um, I think that sometimes people get a little freaked out by that. They're like, oh my gosh, look at all the things my animal is doing. And um, that actually, I think that leads us nicely into one of the things I wanted to talk about today um, was some of the myths that people have about reinforcement and reinforcement delivery. And um, one of the big ones that I see repeated a lot is that our reinforcement delivery needs to be super fast. So, um, so you know, when we see the animal doing the behavior, we need to start delivering the reinforcer really fast, and we need to get the reinforcer to the animal ASAP, as fast as possible. Um, and I was curious, um, I've heard some people say like within a second, within half a second, within three seconds. I was curious if you had heard any like rules of thumb like that um, that people use. I have. I can't remember what they are. <laughs> I think I stopped thinking about that uh, a number of years ago. I mean, I've never, I haven't actually thought no one's asked me that question before, but my, my gut and feeling on the spot is that I don't think much about that anymore because I'm just watching the animal to see if the animal's understanding yeah. the. Yeah, no. 
that's I think that's a great point is that like it it depends on the animal. But, you know, I think we try to make up these rules. And it's funny because I was remembering back to one of the very first behavior analysis classes I took. We were talking about um, we were talking about, I think, working with children. And we were reading some article and the article said that you need to deliver a reinforcer within 10 seconds. Um and, you know, you think about that in terms of animal training and shaping a behavior. But, you know, if my animal, uh, you know, I think about my horse, if my horse lowered his head and I waited 10 seconds to the reinforcer, I'd be like, oh, my gosh, there would be so much happening and so many other things going on. And it would be so, so late. And I wouldn't um, I wouldn't be able to give the reinforcer in time. Um, did you want to add something? I just did some maths. I did 10 divided by 0. 0.6. I figured out you could fit 16.66. Clicks and <laughs> <laughs> ten click, 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 click. Yeah. You know, so I, I think we try to come up with all of these rules, 10 seconds, five seconds, three seconds, half a second. And, uh, but, but overall really what people are thinking is that we need to get the reinforcer to the animal as fast as possible. Um, and I, I do think this is important on one hand, but I think it kind of leads us astray on the other hand. And, and what I, what I see a lot of times when I'm working with my clients and when I'm working with the participants in my online classes um, is that people are trying to give the reinforcer really, really fast. Um, and particularly when someone has an animal that's also really fast, um, this leads the trainer to become like flustered and anxious because, uh, you know, the... My, the, I hate using border collies as examples, but that's kind of the stereotypic example that comes to mind. You know, you think, um, you know, you know, you think, oh, I have to give the reinforcer really, really fast, otherwise my dog's gonna, you know, start doing other behaviors and offer other behaviors, and 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 it just leads us to be flustered and uncomfortable, and and we're trying to give the reinforcer really fast just to cover or to cover up or to prevent um, behavior on our animal's part. Um, and this is actually, um, I know you've had Sean and Masa on the podcast talking about uh, the constructional approach and, and, and thinking about building the behaviors we want. So, you know, if we think about this from like a constructional perspective, if we're trying to give the reinforcer really, really fast to prevent behavior, then we're not being very constructional. We're just trying to like cover up or prevent stuff. Um, so, you know, I think instead of trying to be really, really fast, just to prevent, just to make sure we reinforce the behavior and to prevent our animal from doing unwanted behavior, what we can do instead is we can think about what do I want my animal to do during reinforcement delivery? And, um, and then we can actually teach our animal what we want them to be doing um, while we're delivering the reinforcer, while they're consuming the reinforcer, and, and that back and forth sequence of behaviors that I was talking about before, um, we can actually teach that to our animal and have a predictable sequence that's going to happen after the click or after the yes or after whatever marker that we're using um, that our animals will understand and that what we'll understand. And if we don't want it to be fast, um, it doesn't have to be fast. Um, but but I think I think the the difference here is thinking about what what behaviors do we want to happen after the marker or after the click, and that's that may be that may sound really weird to some people because we think about like the click as the condition reinforcer that comes after the behavior that we're trying to train, and what we're talking about now is training behaviors that are going to come after the click. Um, but but it um, but but everything's behavior. Behavior is always occurring, um, and so we can can um, shape and teach and modify those behaviors that occur um, after the click. Um, if, if we want to, we just have to go through a teaching process um, to teach our animal what to do. Yeah, and, and just want to add, we, we don't need any more things to make trainers flustered. We have enough <laughs> things to make us flustered. So if we, if we can nail this, that'll be super helpful. <clears throat> that, that, that brings me back to the, that point of getting granular, that we talked about before because we think about the clicker being the consequence but if we get granular then that consequence becomes the antecedent for the next abc therefore it becomes a cue or a signal to communicate to the animal what to do so we're kind of doing full circle here and coming back to that granularity of breaking the one abc out into many more abcs yeah yeah that's that's a 
that's a perfect point, um, Ryan, that that what we have during the reinforcement delivery actually becomes a whole lot of like ABC, 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 where where each each um, C, each consequence becomes the antecedent for the next behavior. So we often think of the clicker or the marker um, or the bridge as for its reinforcing properties as a condition reinforcer, but it's also going to be an antecedent. It's also going to cue our animal to do um, cue our animal to do specific behaviors, and we can and so. One thing that um, that Dr. Jesus results really, really likes to talk about, and I, I really like this terminology too, is that sequence of interactions during reinforcement delivery, we can think of it as an interlocking chain um, or an interlocking sequence of behaviors. And, and what that word interlocking means is I click, I'll go back to the example with the dog that I was using before. It's fairly simple, but for some of the stuff, I think it's, help, it's helpful to keep it simpler and not to make it too complex. Um, but so when I click, I, I'm, I'm reinforcing the dog for sitting, um, but the click also um, cues the dog that reinforcement is coming soon. So the dog's ears perk up. So we can think of the click as a cue for the dog to perk, to perk his ears. And then when he perks his ears, that tells me he's paying attention. He's ready for the reinforcer. So now I start reaching for the reinforcer. And then as I start reaching for the reinforcer, um, he that, that cues him to turn his head, turn his eyes, start watching my hand movements. Um, and, then at, and then I see him watching my hand movements. And that cues me to continue getting the treat and reaching down with the treat. You can think about like if, if the dog didn't watch my hand movements, if he turned around or started barking at something outside, or ran off, I wouldn't continue with the rest of my sequence. So we have these, these interlocking pieces where I do something, the dog does something, I do something, the dog does something, and it's all happening really fast. Um, but at each step, my behavior is cueing the next behavior for the dog, and then his behavior is cueing the next behavior for me, and then um, and then so on and so forth as we go through the sequence. And then each link as well reinforces um, the previous links. Yeah, and then you can think about if the dog turns around and barks, you wouldn't keep doing the sequence, but what would you do then? And then you can think about potential contingencies if something else happens and you one in that sequence and to minimize the fluster <laughs> yeah 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 exactly so, yeah oh and i meant um actually that's a that's a great point yeah i was talking like the dog barks like he got distracted by something so he's like i'm off but you know you could also have the dog you could have barking that has gotten built into your reinforcement system and and i think often we think of that just as the dogs the dogs engaging in barking i need to get the reinforcer to him as fast as possible before he starts barking um and we're going back to kind of that that anxious super fast reinforcement delivery that i was talking about at the beginning um but but what we can do instead if we're thinking about this interlocking sequence of behaviors, um, what becomes really cool is we can actually, um, and going back to what you were talking about before about slow motion video, if we're identifying this back and forth sequence, we can watch the video in slow motion and we can actually see what's causing the barking. You know, if, if, if your dog barks during reinforcement delivery, um, is he starting barking when you click? Is he starting barking when you reach for the tree? Is he starting barking when you lean down? And my bet is that there that there is a specific cue within your sequence um, that is producing the barking, um, and it may not be what you think it is. So, so a horse example of this is is a lot of. Um, a lot of the clients who I work with, um, sometimes one of the unwanted behaviors that they want to clean up is when they click, reach in their treat pouch and present a treat for their horse, the horse's head is turning towards them and coming into their space, maybe even sniffing the treat pouch while they're, while they're getting the treat. And it can be interesting to figure out what is the cue for the horse to turn his head towards you? And it's not always the same. Sometimes it's the click that's producing that head turn towards you. Sometimes it's the hand reaching for the treat pouch. Um, sometimes it's the sound of the food jiggling around in the treat pouch. 
Um, sometimes the horse keeps his head straight. And then it's once you get the treat and your hand is coming forward towards his nose, that now his, hand, his head is coming and turning towards you. Um, and, and so it can be really fun um, to figure out like, what are all the unwanted behaviors and when are they happening and what's cueing what. But then if you have unwanted behaviors happening as well, figuring out like what, what about your behavior is cueing certain extra behaviors or unwanted behaviors for your animal. Reminds me of, an, of another video we made a long time ago and it was an unwanted behavior in the reinforcement system or in the whole training session was ears down in a dog. This dog would mm. have his ears down and its back arched and its tail tucked between its legs. But then it had its ears up sometimes during a session. And we're like, you know, we if we were to hypothesize, which you may be wrong, that the dog is feeling better when its ears are up and it's not feeling as good when its ears are down, we want to see more ears up in the session. And so we took that video and... We took all of the segments when the ears were up and we saw what was happening during that time. And there was a very clear cor correlation in my mind between hand going in food pouch and ears going up. And it, and it was fun because we took that segment and we played it on loop. Uh, so hand goes in pouch, hand comes out of pouch. And the trainer was just doing this little dance. And it was like they had a string attached to their hand. And they put their hand in the pouch and the ears go up and they put it out and the ears go down. <laughs> Um, so that was an example of it was really clear that there was this part of the reinforcement system that was influencing a very specific desirable behavior in our animal. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's an awesome example. Um, and you know, I think it's one thing that that example reminded me of as well is, um, I think we have to be really careful about our interactions with our animals during reinforcement delivery. Um, because, and I, I don't know, I don't know the case with this particular dog, but I think sometimes things like that, like the ears back with the dog or the ears, horse trainers get ears back a lot during clicker training. Um, and, and sometimes that is tied to discomfort and, and the horse being uncomfortable or unhappy or frustrated. But sometimes as well, um, those sorts of things can get captured as part of the sequence um, when we're initially introducing the animal to, to positive reinforcement training, particularly if there's a little bit of uncertainty or confusion at the beginning. And then, you know, we, we, we don't realize it, but those things become reinforced and become part of the sequence. So now those behaviors are continuing to be, to be repeated, um, even, though, even though they're not behaviors we want. And even though they're not behaviors that we purposely tried to train, um, we've just inadvertently captured them um, as part of the as part of the reinforcement process or as part of the even the larger training session. Which brings us to another misconception that we talked prior to the pushing, pushing record that we were going to talk about today. And that is the misconception is that the click slash marker works like a camera to capture what the animal was doing at the moment of reinforcement. And if you hold this misconception, you might fall into the trap of the thing that you just talked about. Do you want to yeah, share a little bit yeah. about this with us? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I remember hearing about this when I first was really new to clicker training and new to positive reinforcement training. A lot of people talked about how the click works like a camera. Um, and we can just think of like clicking the clicker, like we're snapping a photo and, and we're capturing the moment that the animal is doing at the click. Um, and, and I think we often get, I think this metaphor can be helpful, but it also can get us in trouble and it can lead to situations where we're perplexed by why behavior is continuing to happen. Um, so I like to instead think of the click as working more like a video camera. Um, and, and rather than the start button, it's like the end button of the video camera. So like when you click, um, what you've, what you've done is you've just, um, potentially captured everything that the animal was doing um, before the click, including what they were doing at the moment of the click. Um, and of course, you can you you have to you have to um, analyze the behavior and see what's going on. But um, in a, in a lot of cases, our animals are continuing to repeat behaviors that may be happening way before the click. And so if the behavior is being maintained, um, then, then you're reinforcing it. So let me give you a few examples because just to, to make sure people can make sense of what I'm talking about here. So like, so I had a service dog who I was working with um, for a while. Actually, he was a service dog in training and he, um, he was staying with me um, for a few months. And someone had worked with this dog previously on eye contact. Um, however, they had inadvertently captured 
captured some fidgeting behavior where he would kind of dance with his feet or paw with his feet and kind of wiggle his body. And, and he would, he would, um, he would almost perfectly, he would fidget for four or five or six seconds and then be very, very still and make eye contact for several seconds. Um, and that, and, and even though the previous trainer had been reinforcing him for that, for those several seconds of stillness, what they had inadvertently reinforced and captured was this whole sequence of fidget, 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 be still, fidget, 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 be still. And so that's what, that's what he thought he was supposed to be doing. Um, I, I've seen examples too, where people are working with um, horses or even other animals as well, where they want the animal, uh, we get, we get in trouble with this, with lots of animals, where they want the animal to be standing or sitting with its head forward and the animal turns their head to the side and then turns their head back to the center. And now the horse is back in the correct position, click, treat. And you think you're reinforcing the animal, you think you're reinforcing the horse for having their head straight, um, but really what you just reinforced is the whole head turn, head back to center, click treat. Um, and and the, the way to tell if that's happening or not is to see what does the animal continue to do? And often what the animal continues to do is that entire sequence of turn the head to the side, turn the head back straight, click treat. And then maybe there's a pause and then the animal turns their head to the side and turns the head back straight. Um, and, and that can be really frustrating for the person. But the, the idea there is that we're th- when we think of the click as a camera, we're thinking in terms of, of reinforcing a position or reinforcing an outcome. And so what I think is really important to think about instead is reinforcement can't capture an outcome. What we're capturing and what we're selecting is movement. Um, and sometimes what we're capturing is, is long sequences of movement um, um, that, that are occurring before the, before the, before the click. And so we could, <laughs> we could spend all afternoon, Ryan, talking about, like, how do you fix this? How do you clean it up? Um, but, but what I would suggest for people is I think often what I see people do is they, they think they can clean it up by clicking or reinforcing or bridging when the animal is in the correct position. And often what they end up doing is just continuing to um, continuing to reinforce the whole pattern. And so the, the, a better solution is often to go back to an earlier approximation, a much smaller loop, a much smaller sequence um, um, where you have, and, and sometimes this means changing the context, going to a different room, getting a different platform, delivering the treat in a different way, changing something, and and going back to um, going back to a, a smaller sequence of behavior or a different component that allows you to capture a clean sequence of behavior that has the the wanted behavior that that you're that you're trying to reinforce and that doesn't have um, unwanted movement. And and once you can find a, a good starting point where the animal can be successful, then you can start um, growing the behavior from there. So when we all, when some of us go and do our KPA certification and we have to train our 10-part chain, we get a little bit worried, but we are really all masterful trainers of chain. And it reminds me of, once again, coming back to that granularity, uh, we, we kind of, if we got more granular with our ABCs and those contingencies that were happening there, we might be able to identify the chains that are leading up to this. But that's a nerdy way of saying <laughs> it's not like taking a picture um, or, or working like a camera. Um, yeah. and, and I was going to say something, but it's, it's kind of talking about what we were talking about earlier. So I still want to say it. I still want to talk about something else as well, but... I'm going to come back to it. So remind me to come back to this thought that I'm not sharing right now, Mary, if I don't, before the end of the episode. We've talked about a misconception. Actually, let's, that... go, let's, let's go back to it because I had something okay, okay. I, I want to was, talk about well, too. Maybe they're, maybe they're related. <laughs> oh, how cool would that be? Great minds think alike. Um, it, comes, it comes down to you're talking like, what do you do here? How do you fix it? Going back to a smaller sequence of behavior. Uh, but uh, my thoughts were thinking about how do we, what are some good ways for trainers to evaluate their reinforcements? Uh, and two ideas I had were play portal 
uh, and do the reinforcement system from section from Portal, which always seems, once again, I'm repeating something that I said earlier, potentially a little bit simple and a little bit like something we might be able to brush over. But it sets the foundations in Portal, in my personal opinion, for the whole rest of Portal is to get that reinforcement system uh, really clear both for the teacher and the learner at the start of playing Portal. Um, but also in that Portal, sorry, in that Portal section, in that reinforcement section in the Portal manual, there are some extra questions. Am I getting this right? Extra questions at the end of the chapter, as there are in a lot of the chapters in Portal. And you put some questions in there in terms of how people can evaluate their own reinforcement systems when they go and apply it with their um, learners out in the real world. Um, so I was, my, my question was, can you share some of those questions with our listeners so that they can uh, get, a, get a pen, everyone, and get a pen and some paper to write them down or go to your reinforcement system section in your portal manual. Um, but can you share what some of these questions are? Because I think they're really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So, um, is that what you were thinking? No, but but oh. <laughs> actually, as the portal will lead into something interesting that I was thinking about. Um, but and I'm laughing a little bit because um, you started talking about portal, and it's like, oh, I could talk about portal all afternoon too. Um, so could so I. this is this is a little dangerous. But I did want to. I'm sure most people know what portal is, but just in case there's people who are listening who don't. So Portal is the Portable Operant Research and Teaching Lab, and it's a tabletop um, shaping game that's played by um, two people. So one person plays the role of the teacher, the other is the learner, and you have a collection of small objects, and the teacher has to shape the learner to do things um, using the clicker um, before, or using the clicker without without talking to the person or, or modeling the behavior or something like that. So it's a great way to simulate um, animal training and to improve your animal training skills. Um, so I've been, I have, a, I have an online um, virtual class that I teach through Behavior Explorer on reinforcement systems. And we've been, we've been playing around with the, the reinforcement um, exercises in the portal manual. And, and I find it funny every time I teach this class because, um, because several of my students will tell me every time they're like, I wasn't going to do the reinforcement exercises because I thought I didn't need it to because, you know, I've been training for so long and then they go and do them and they come back and they say, I learned so much from doing this. It gave me so much insight into my animal and into animal training. And, and it helped me think more deliberately about my own behavior um, while I'm, while I'm delivering reinforcers. And one thing that I think can be really helpful for people by playing Portal is that um, we really emphasize in Portal that you should click the clicker, then reach for the block. And, and we use blocks as reinforcers. And the the important um, the, the importance here and, and um, something that I think is really, really useful for people to think about is what do you want your animal to think or what, what cue do you want? Ah, sorry, I'm all tongue tied. Let me back up. What, what should be your animal's cue that reinforcement delivery is starting? And, um, and oftentimes um, when we are training our animals, we start getting a little sloppy um, or we're just not paying attention and we start reaching for the treats before we click um, or before we, we bridge or mark if we're using something other than a clicker. And the, and, and, and sometimes we're doing this, you know, cause we're trying to get the rein, going back to being fast. We're trying to get the reinforcer ready fast and have it ready to give our animal. Um, but, but what happens if you're reaching for the treat, um, before you mark, before you click, that's going to start becoming your clicker. Your animal's going to see your hand movement and know that reinforcement delivery um, is starting. And um, so that's something that can be really revealing by playing portal is that often the portal, your human portal learner knows, notices that your hand is moving early and they start watching watching your hand movements instead of listening for the click. So um, if one thing you can... Um, do to improve your training, improve your reinforcement delivery, go take some video of a training session, or if you have recent video, watch your video, watch your video in slow motion and, um, see when, see when your hand starts moving. Um, does your hand start, uh, if you're using your hand to give, 
um, give a treat or give a ball or, or toss a frisbee or whatnot. Um, and and what I like to do is I like to think, click, pause, just a short pause, just half a second or so, and then I begin reaching for the treat. And that and that pause there allows me to to make sure my animal has heard the click and that they're still focused on me and that they're ready for um, reinforcement delivery. And if you if you um, consistently put a little bit of pa- of a pause in there, you're going to start seeing behavior happening. There. Going back to the granularity that we were talking about. So like um, what I often see with the horse is if I click brief pause, I'll see them flick an ear towards me. Um, and then I reach for the treat and, and give them the treat. And that ear flick tells me that they've heard the click. They're ready for the treat. They're, they're focused and ready for the food delivery. So um, I, um, I got really excited there because we started talking about portal and I don't even really remember what we were talking about before, but um, I think I think we were talking about improving your reinforcement systems. So um, I would, um, I think, I think one of the, the, one of the best tools is video. Um, But two two other suggestions I would give people um, um, is number one, practice your reinforcement delivery and your reinforcement system separate from working on other behaviors. Um, I think often we're trying to improve our reinforcement delivery while we're also trying to teach or trying to shape a new behavior or put it on cue or do something else. And there's just too many moving parts. So um, um, the, the, the less you can be doing is often actually better because that lets you analyze what your animal's doing, analyze what you're doing and start cleaning things up. Um, and, and kind of an extension of that is I even like to practice. Um, I like to put your dog, um, you know, outside with an enrichment toy or, uh, or leave your horse out in the pasture and, and do a rehearsal, um, without your animal. Um, I find I learned so much from doing that. I realized, oh, why did I even think about having this here? And, oh, my treat pouch is a little bit too far back. I need to have it more on my side or, um, you know, I, I and I figure out the timing of things too. Um, when is this going to happen? When is this going to happen? And I realized there's all sorts of details that, that I wasn't thinking about. Out, um, that I need to consider and I need to plan for um, just by rehearsing through my actions um, without the animal. Yeah, I feel there's different people listening to this podcast right now absorbing this information in different ways. There's people who do this and they're like, of course, yeah, man, I wish everyone knew like how valuable this was. And there's people that are like your portal students who are like, man, I don't know if I need to do this. But like once they do it, they're going to go, oh my God, I learned so much. Like I just, my mind's racing with examples as you're talking about times we've done this and just how so many light bulb moments and insights and ideas of improvement have come out of um, doing that process. I'm looking at the time and doing two things. Firstly, I'm celebrating because uh, as the listeners of the show know, I love to get my guests passion talking. And what does that look like? That looks like them saying, I forgot what the question was. I'm, 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 <laughs> so I, I've got my reinforcement from this episode today. The second thing is there was another misconception that we wanted to talk about before we wrap up. And that one is that the click slash market ends the animal's behavior. Well, We've actually talked about it, but did you want to unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, I think um, I think we've already given people a lot of things to think about for today. So let's just talk touch on this briefly, um, and then um, um, and then then we can then we will have talked about it. Um, so yeah, so it's interesting. One thing that I hear people saying a lot too is that the click ends be- behavior, like. And, and this goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning. Um, there's behavior happening um, before the click, and there's lots of behavior happening after the click, too. And so if we're thinking about the click as ending behavior, then I think a lot of times we end up not um, paying attention to what behavior is happening in the click. What We end up not paying attention to what behavior is happening after the click. And then there may start being unwanted behaviors or little extra behaviors that start creeping in and those behaviors start getting bigger and bigger. And then suddenly we notice them when now they're a really big problem. Um, So, you know, instead of thinking of the click as ending behavior, um, I think a a better way to conceptualize this is thinking of the click as helping us shift from one behavior to the next set of behaviors. So like what we were talking about before with the, with the sequence during reinforcement delivery, 
my animal has just done a whole series of behaviors, which are hopefully the desired behaviors that I'm trying to teach. Now I click and what the click does is now the click shifts the animal into the next sequence of behaviors um, that that are needed for the animal to um, collect the collect and consume um, the reinforcer. And, and going back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, it's funny, Ryan, I think we could, I keep saying we could talk all afternoon. I think we could talk for weeks and weeks about all this, all this reinforcement delivery stuff. But, um, but, you know, when we think about the click as starting a sequence of behaviors, um, that I think that's really, really exciting and really, um, I don't know if empowering is the right word, but, but it gives us, it, get, it opens up possibilities. It gives us more options because I think sometimes we just get stuck with like, I'm just going to click and hand the treat to my animal. Um, but we can teach, we can teach, um, we can teach our animal exactly what we want them to do after that click or after that marker. So I had a student in one of my classes last year and she wanted to, um, she wanted to work on a reinforcement system that would slow down her dog a little bit. She has one of those dogs who tends to be a, a really fast dog. Um, who's eager and happy, which is good, but also offering a lot of behavior. And she also wanted to um, kind of work towards some ways to deliver reinforcers where she didn't have the reinforcer, um, the reinforcer on her. And so she she built up to a reinforcement system where they could be in the middle of the room and she could click. And then um, the dog would orient to her to tell her, yep, I heard the click. I, I know I did the right behavior. I know reinforcement's starting. And then she would start walking to the side of the room where she had a bowl on a table and a bowl on the ground. Um, and then she would take, and, and, and her starting to walk was the cue for the dog to follow her. And the dog would walk with her. And then when they got to the bowls, the dog would sit. And then she would get a treat from the bowl on the table, put a treat in the bowl on the ground. The dog would take the treat. Um, when the dog would look back up at her, that was the dog's way of saying, I'm done, I'm ready for more. And then they could both move back um, um, to the middle of the room again. And this, um, she couldn't, and the, the point I want to make with this story is you can't just, if, if you want your animal to do certain behaviors during reinforcement, you can't just say, let's do it and expect your animal to do it. She had to go through a, a systematic training process um, to teach her animal the sequence of behaviors. And it, it took actually quite a few steps, but once they got it trained, um, she had this really, really smooth, um, cool way of delivering reinforcers that looked very engaging at each step. She would do something, the dog would do something. She would do something, the dog would do something. And it, it, it made me laugh. These types of reinforcement systems make me laugh because there actually was quite a bit of delay between when the dog did the behavior they were shaping and when the reinforcer was delivered. Um, but because they had this predictable sequence that she had taught and that the dog understood, um, it was a very effective way to deliver reinforcers. And it also, it, it kept the dog a lot calmer and a lot more focused than some of kind of the, the nervous, anxious offering behavior energy um, that she was getting before. And once again, Ryan, I don't even remember where we started from that. So um, you've done a good job this afternoon getting me um, passion talking about reinforcement systems. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I'm so reinforced right now. Um, <laughs> and I'm biting my tongue because you're right. Uh, we could keep talking and talking and talking, but I'm looking at the time and I'm going to stay within the time zone, time zone of our episode today. So I'm going to stop and I'm going to stop also because there are other exciting opportunities for you, the listener of the show, coming up to talk for hours and to talk for weeks about this stuff. Do you want to remind everyone listening, Mary, what we talked about at the start of the show and this Behavior Explorer Summit that you have coming up, correct me if I'm wrong, called Building, Building Re Reinforcement Systems for Accelerated, accelerated Learning. learning. <laughs> yes. So so this is our 2023 uh, Behavior Explorer Summit, Building Reinforcement Systems for, for Accelerating Learning. Ah, I'm getting tongue-tied. Building Reinforcement Systems for Accelerated Learning. And it's going to be myself, Dr. Jesus Rosales-Riz, and our um, friend Crystal Fernandez. 
and we'll have four virtual sessions um, starting on March 30th and then every other week um, for four times. And um, you will have, I know there's people listening to this podcast all over the world, so you'll have access to the recordings as well if you're not able to come live. But basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be, we keep talking about the small details, the granularity of what's happening during um, reinforcement. We're going to be geeking out over that and going really, really in depth um, and looking at both kind of the theoretical, the conceptual, why do things happen? Why should we do things certain way, certain ways? And then also the very practical, how do we How do we actually do this? So Ryan and I have talked through a lot of examples today, um, but um, in the summit, we'll go a lot more detail of like the step-by-step, how do you build these types of reinforcement systems that keep your animal engaged, that minimize unwanted behaviors, um, and that really help um, set your animal up so it's easy for you to teach the behaviors that you're teaching. So I would love to have some of you join us, and there's um, more information on behavior experience. Um, That's also where you can find more information about Portal if you want more information about Portal. Yeah, I was going to say there's so much information uh, and available on that website to just go and start learning. Now, we will, of course, link to all of that in the show notes as well. Mary, this has been so much fun. So from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, we really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today again. It's really appreciated. It's been awesome. Thank you for having me. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.